Welcome to The Long-Term Investor. I am joined today by Brian Feraldi, author of Why Does the Stock Market Go Up? Everything You Should Have Been Taught About Investing in School But Weren't. And I really love this book. It's breaking down the most common questions that everyday people have about the stock market and investing. And even someone like myself, who obviously spends a lot of time reading and learning, I really enjoyed this. I, I read it in a single day, which is always my favorite thing. I feel like books are way too long these days. But Brian, you did a tremendous job with this. Um, this may be one of my go-to recommendations for people wanting to learn more or just completely new to investing. So thanks so much for joining me here today. I'm really excited to have you share some of this knowledge with our audience. Thanks so much for having me, Peter. I'm thrilled to hear you say that. This book was completely aimed at beginners and people that knew absolutely nothing, and it was designed to be easy to read. So I'm glad you had that experience. Well, and even if you are a beginner, I think that term beginner is interesting because I work with lots of people who are already retired and have been investing their whole life, but don't actually understand the basics. And so let's do, let's just go ahead and start with the basics. I think a good place to start might be maybe you could explain how investors determine what a business is worth. Yeah, that's a tricky that's a tricky question, um, and it's one of the mo it's one of the most nuanced aspects about uh, investing. But but broadly speaking, while there are several different ways to to value a company, uh, one of the easiest ways to think about how to value a company is just a multiple of the company's revenue or profits at uh, excuse me, multiple of the company's profits or net income at, at any given time. And that really gets back to the the PE ratio. The PE ratio is a very common term that a lot of investors, even new investors. Uh, tend, tend to know about. But broadly speaking, let's pretend that uh, there was a very simple candy shop uh, that was out there that was creating $1 million in profits every single year. $1 million next year, $1 million next year, $1 million. Let's say I own this candy shop because good for me, and I want to sell this candy shop to somebody else. So, Peter, I offer it to you. Uh, I say, Peter, I'm interested in selling this candy shop. It does a million dollars in profits a year. How much will you pay for it? Well, let's pretend we had no idea what we were doing, right? We had no idea how to value uh, a company. And you said, Brian, I'll pay you $2 million for your candy shop. And I say, okay, uh, that sounds good to me. I get $2 million today, and I sell it to you. So the price of the deal is $2 million. The earnings of the deal that you're expected to earn um, in one year is uh, $1 million. So the PE ratio of the deal uh, is two. Well, is that good? Well, one way to think about that is to take the inverse of that number. So the earnings of the deal are $1 million. You paid $2 million for it. That is a 50% return on your investment. So you buy this asset for $2 million, and each year you essentially get a 50% return on your investment. I don't know about you, that sounds like a fantastic return to me, especially with bank accounts paying, what, 1%? Uh, so it's, it's logical to say that $2 million is probably too low of a purchase price. Let's throw another wild number out there. Let's say you offered me $100 million for that same business, right? So the P-E ratio of that deal is 100. So 100 million is the purchase price divided by $1 million in earnings per year, P-E ratio of 100. Well, let's do that same calculation. Let's take the inverse of that number. That's a 1% return on your investment each year. Why would you go through the hassle of owning and operating a candy store to earn a 1% return when you could stick your money in like a T-bill and get a higher return than that? So broadly speaking, $2 million, probably too low. $100 million, probably too high. So evaluation and figuring out what a business is worth is the art of coming to a price that makes sense sense for the seller, entices the seller to sell the business, and also entices the buyer to buy the business, and it's coming up with a return that both parties find to be satisfactory. So let's just for say that we say a 10% return on your investment is logical, so that would be a P-E ratio of 10, that would be a purchase price of $10 million. That is a ridiculously simple way to value a business, but it shows the relationship between what a business does in profits and how much it should be worth. I love that explanation, Brian. Maybe you could go into, though, obviously valuations aren't static. You know, the P-E ratio of any given company isn't going to be, say, 10 forever. So maybe you could describe for us some of the things that change a valuation. 
Yeah, there are a whole bunch of factors that change that price to earnings ratio that we talked about. And that very simple example we just said, uh, we just assumed that profits of this business were going to be $1 million forever. Well, no such business exists that generates the exact same amount of profits uh, in any given year uh, forever. Uh, some businesses, first off, never generate a profit. So that, that calculation goes right out the window. Uh, other businesses have highly variable profits, right? When the economy is doing well and humming profits skyrocket when the recession hits uh, and demand wanes profits fall to the floor and different businesses have different cyclicalities uh, to their profits some companies can remain profitable and even grow their profits during bad periods other companies cannot so those factors certainly go into influence how much uh, an investor should be willing to pay uh, for a company Broadly speaking, the more dependable a company's profits, the higher a purchase price should be. The more recession-proof a company's profits, the higher the purchase price should be. The faster the growth in a company's profits, the higher a purchase price should be. And the inverse is also true. It also depends on what prevailing interest rates are at any given time. Previously, we said that paying 100 times earnings was far too much. Well, if the prevailing interest rates that you could get elsewhere are 0%, a 1% return sounds not that terrible by comparison. Uh, conversely, if interest rates skyrocketed to 7 or 8%, uh, percent, uh, that 1% return you could get from that uh, sounds awful. So there are numerous factors that go into figuring out a, uh, what a business is worth, to say nothing of the investor psychology uh, involved in a transaction. So this is why stock prices are so confusing to so many people. There are hundreds of variables that control how much a business is worth on any given day, which is why stock pr prices bounce around the way they do. Right. They bounce around every day. And it makes sense when a stock price goes up or down on some new piece of information. You know, we've recently, as of this recording, we had some retailers come out with some bad forward guidance. And so as a result, people expected profits to be lower in the future. And so like you said, with the valuation, if I think profits are going to be lower and I'm going to keep my valuation stable at, say, 10 for the candy shop, well, then the price needs to go down. But, you know, over the long term, you, what, why, what is really driving the ups and downs? We know in the, in the short term, it's news, or actually, maybe I should take a step back. When there isn't news, what do you think is driving price in any given day if there's no major news item that you see? Well, in the short term, prices are primarily driven by investor psychology. Uh, businesses, especially big, large businesses that are established, don't really change that much on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. However, the value that investors assign to their, their businesses can change pretty rapidly on a day-to-day -day basis based on the broad psychology uh, of all market participants. I mean, it's worth remembering that a the stock market uh, is, is kind of like a continuous live auction. If you've ever been to an auction before, you know how prices work, right? Prices tend to start low and then continue to go up and up and up. And it really depends on the excitement of the crowd, how many people are interested on bidding in that particular item, what the competition is for that item at that particular time. And the price that the, the price that the auctioneer gets, especially a skilled one, continually goes higher until they finally can't, until the, the maximum uh, price is reached. Well, conversely, if there are a few less market participants or if by and large, the people that are bidding are less excited for whatever reason the price of that uh, can fall. Well, that's exactly the same way that the, the stock market uh, works. There are market participants that are out there buying and selling securities, and on any given day or any given moment, uh, sometimes buyers are more eager than sellers and prices rise. Sometimes uh, buyers are less eager, and to entice them to buy, prices have to fall, and that's why prices squiggle around all day long. Well, and I think you make a good point here that in the book, I'm, and I'm looking directly at it, the stock market moved up or down based on how optimistic or pessimistic investors felt on any given day. And if there are lots of optimistic investors about the future, they're going to buy. And if the buyers outweigh the sellers, that's just a supply and demand thing. So the market's clearing out supply and demand. If we're all bidding on the same thing, like you said at an auction, the price is going to go up. If we're all trying to sell it, and not that many buyers, the price is going to have to fall to make that supply and demand clear. But over the long term, I think you do a nice job of identifying that stocks really track earnings, right? Over the long term? 
that is very much uh, how it works. Let's go back to our candy uh, shop example where we said we're going to earn, that pro that business is going to earn $1 million each and every year. And we just said that a fair price for that business was a P.E. ratio of 10. The business is worth roughly $10 million. That's a roughly fair price that would entice you, the buyer, and entice me, uh, the seller. Well, let's say that that business was growing, and it grew its profits pretty rapidly. And over a period of 10 years, that candy shop's profits went from $1 million dollars to five million dollars. Well, after ten years, what is that candy shop worth now that its profits are five million dollars a year versus one million dollars a year? Well, at that same PE ratio of ten, uh, it would be logical to assume that that business is now worth fifty million dollars. That is a good purchase price for that company because the profits five x. The exact same principle applies to any business and the stock market as a whole. Uh, investors pay a multiple of, of profits to figure out what the price of, uh, of a profitable business uh, should be. And as those profits increase over time, so too should the value uh, of the business. So this is why I think investors should have so much confidence in the S&P 500, the Dow, and the NASDAQ continuing to rise for the rest of our, our lives. There are a number of underlying forces in play that continually push the profitability of the companies that make up those indices steadily higher uh, over time. Not in a straight line, right? The, the, we live in the real world where are there are certainly ups and downs, but when viewed over long periods of time, those forces continually increase the profitability of companies, hence why the stock market continually moves up. And I'm going to complicate a little bit what is your beautifully simplified version in the book. But when I think about stock market returns, if I look backwards, I can attribute them to one of three things. It can be Changes in earnings growth. So as you pointed out, as earnings grow, price tends to follow. Return of cash. So whether that's dividends or stock buybacks and changes in valuation. So if you think a company is going to do well, you might be willing to pay a higher multiple or pay at a higher price per earnings, a higher PE ratio, even though the profits aren't there yet, because you're really optimistic that the profits will follow. So some of the returns in early years in that instance will be a change in valuation, whereas in future years, in order for the price to maintain, you might see the valuation not contribute as much to growth, but earnings be a bigger contributor to growth. I think when you think about this in the short term or the long term with an individual stock, it's very clear. But a lot of times, and I know a lot of the work that you do for Motley Fool, for example, you're addressing issues where people try to complicate why stocks are going up or down so much more so than that. Any thoughts on on why people are confusing what is actually driving price, either in the short term, in the long term, or at the micro level or macro level? No, I, I think you I think you did a really good job there uh, of nailing it. In fact, if you just look back at the the last roughly two decades, the 2000 to 2010 and 2010 to 2020, I think you were spot on with what happened during those periods. Most people know that the 2000s were, broadly speaking, a rough period uh, for investors uh, in general, right? It started with the tech crash uh, and the 2000-2002 uh, bear market, and it ended with the, dot com, uh, with the uh, Great Recession, the 2008-2009 uh, decline. So during that period, market returns were basically flat uh, for an entire uh, period. Now, what happened there? Well, dividends continued to be paid and continued to go up, so investors continued to get that return. Earnings continued to be uh, <clears throat> to increase, broadly speaking, over, over, over the decade, although they did take a massive hit in 2008 and 2009. But the thing that really worked against investors was the change in valuation. Uh, coming into the 2000s, valuations were very, very high and elevated. And ending the 2010s, valuations were artificially low. When you combine those things, three things together, the earnings growth and the dividends growth was not strong enough to overwhelm the big change in valuation. From 2010 to 2020, dividends continued to grow. Those are actually fairly stable and predictable. Earnings uh, continued to, to grow, but the thing that really boosted investor returns was changes in valuation. Invest of stocks, by and large, went from undervalued in 2010 to, one could argue, overvalued by the end of, of 2020. So that acted a headwind in the, 20, uh, in the 2000s and a tailwind in the 2010s. 
This is why market what, what happens uh, in, in the market can be so confusing to so many people. Uh, just over the past year, we've seen many companies valuations absolutely collapse. And in so many cases, uh, Zoom, uh, for example, uh, Tesla, uh, for, for example, the businesses are stronger today than they were uh, a year ago. Those companies have more revenue, they have better margins, they have more profits than they did a year ago. Yet those stocks are down 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%, or or even more. Why is that? Because the change in valuation so overwhelmed the change in, in earnings. Uh, this is why the only way that I know to invest successfully is to invest with a long-term mindset focused on the fundamental growth driver of, of companies' uh, success, which is the growth in profits, and just accept that sometimes valuation is going to be a tailwind and sometimes it's going to be a headwind. And I think if we go back to your candy store example, and we're assuming that it has a PE of 10, but I think that it's ultimately going to expand and have thousands of stores and get into new market. They're going to get into milkshakes. They're going to get into, I don't know what candy stores get into, ice cream. That's basically the same as milkshakes, but you get my point. I think they're going to have more profits than they currently have. And so as, as a result, I'm going to pay more than 10 times earnings before the price is there. But every time that the valuation rises, your expected return decreases. And I think that people, particularly leading up to 2020 or maybe even leading up to 2022 when we peaked at the beginning of January, looked at a lot of companies and were very optimistic about their future profitability. Whereas to your point, a lot of valuations have now pulled back where sure earnings are down, but it, there's just a drastically different level of pessimism versus optimism for companies. And to your point there at the end, that's why it's so important to have a long holding period because eventually prices follow earnings. And you have some um, stats here in the book, odds of a positive return by holding period. And so if you hold for an S&P 500 for one month, 61% of the time, you're going to have a positive return. Whereas if you extend that to one year, 69% of the time, you're going to have a positive return. The real stuff, though, kicks in longer term. Five years, if you have a five-year holding period, 81% of the time you're in positive. 20 years, there is not a 20-year period without a positive return. Um, and so I think you know it's really important to have this long horizon, as you point out, but then also recognizing that every decade or so, the market crashes. So you know, you've maybe already touched on a little of what has happened more recently, but more from a theoretical perspective – why does the stock market crash? Yeah, the, the, the funny thing about stock market crashes is it's not hard to get people to understand why stocks go down. I think that's actually a fairly intuitive thing. What's not intuitive, or at least wasn't intuitive to me, is why they went up in the first place or why stocks eventually um, recover uh, from crashes. If you look back to the major crashes over the last hundred years, there's almost always some big macro awful thing happening in, in the world, and it makes sense why stocks went down. Uh, so more recently, uh, we had, well, right now we're going through a, a bear market, right? And what's happening? Well, there's a surprise war. There's inflation for the first time in 40 years, and interest rates are rising to say nothing of the supply chain challenges and ongoing lingering effects of COVID. That's a lot of macro headwinds. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, okay, stocks are going down. Everything's terrible uh, right now. 2020, right? What happened in 2020? COVID. That was a big surprise uh, event. It made sense why the stock market uh, went down sharply during that period. 2007 to 2009, we had the housing bubble, uh, the, great financial, the Great Recession, and the financial crisis, right? People were getting kicked out of their house. Unemployment was skyrocketing. Also makes sense why stocks were declining. Then there was 2000, the dot-com crash. Um, then there was 1980, 1982, high inflation uh, and 20% uh, interest rates. 73 to 74, there was the oil embargo and Watergate. 69 to 70, there was, uh, there was Vietnam. Them, right? So there's bad things going on in the economy that, broadly speaking, leads to a mass change in investor psychology. Investors going from very willing to invest and very willing to pay higher prices for, for businesses to periods where nobody wants to invest. And you have to drop prices dramatically in order to entice, entice people uh, to, to invest. 
That change in psychology for the markets in general, going from, yes, I'm interested and excited in investing, to, hell no, I don't want to put any money into the market, it's too scary right now, can happen fairly quickly. And when that happens, that causes prices to, to collapse. So that is the genesis of why stock markets crash. It's usually something bad, macro, causes changes in psychology, leads to massive declines in stock prices. That change in psychology, I think, is what? the average investor misses out on. And my favorite line in your whole book is, since they're always caused by human emotion, they're also unpredictable. And I think that a lot of investors acknowledge, yes, I can't predict the future. I can't predict macro or micro events. But what they miss is the, the psychological piece of it. You know, It's an ever-changing mix of calculus and psychology that goes into changing valuations. And so I think that's such an important point that you raise in not only can you not predict what's going to happen, you cannot predict what millions of market participants are going to collectively feel psychologically. So I absolutely love that. The other thing about crashes um, that crashes are common, but and they're always feeling unique and scary in their own special way, but they also always end. Um, why is it that the stock market always recovers? This is, again, something that really confused me. It's, it made sense, again, it makes sense when, why economies fall apart, and hence it makes sense why the stock market uh, falls apart. I never understood why people always said, well, the market will always come back. Why is it that investors that the investors should have faith that the market always uh, uh, comes back? Well, broadly speaking, there's a couple of things that happens uh, during crashes or during recessions or during bad economic uh, periods that pave the way for good things uh, to happen. First off, whenever a recession occurs or there's a downturn in the economy, that forces that forces a couple things. One, it forces people to be laid off. And when people are laid off and have no no income, they start trying new things. Uh, business formation and companies that start their own, uh, individuals that start their own businesses tend to go up during downturns, right? I was gainfully employed, maybe I had a business idea. Now I'm not employed. Okay, it's time for me to give this entrepreneurship thing uh, a try. Uh, two, during downturns, companies become more innovative, right? When you're fat and happy and making profits, nobody wants to change their ways. When the downturn happens, that's when you're forced to do things uh, differently. I mean, case in point, how much did the business world change between February of 2020 and May uh, of 2020? That was a three-month period when I'm gonna, I'll guess that 5% of people were okay with remote work prior to that, 5% of companies, and 90% of companies were, were okay with remote work in a literally a three-month uh, period. Why did they do that? Because they were forced to, to do it. It's that, that COVID forced changes in business the way that businesses were done. So the world tends to become more innovative, more entrepreneurial whenever there's, there's a downturn. That's thing one. Uh, thing two, weak businesses, bad businesses tend to go belly up during bad periods, right? So you, how many retailers, how many retailers that were hobbling along prior to 2020 went completely belly up in 2020 when business uh, disappeared? A lot of companies that were on a slow path to decline, that decline got accelerated uh, substantially. Well, as those companies go out of business, that leaves their customers looking for needs that need to be fulfilled. And suddenly those customers are willing to give alternatives uh, a, a try. So businesses that survive the downturns end up picking up market share and attracting customers simply because some of their competitors start to disappear. That means that those businesses get stronger, not weaker. This is why sometimes big, uh, big companies with strong balance sheets actually look forward to, to downturns. It, it sucks to, to, to go through, but they know it's a chance for them to actually get aggressive and pick, take market share in their market. So eventually, um, once the bad businesses are eliminated from the economy, the customers go over to the newer and the, and the growing businesses, and that paves the way for those companies' profits to reinflate and grow even faster uh, during our recovery. Uh, finally, the government is certainly aware of what's going on and hates to see downturns, and it's not uncommon 
common for the government to step in to provide assistance to consumers and to businesses uh, during uh, the downturns. We certainly saw that in spades uh, during 2020. That really helped to cushion the blow. We also saw that in uh, 2008 when banks were going out left and right. The government was giving out uh, pretty sweetheart deals uh, and loans. Those things, when combined, eventually lead to a the stop in, in the in the recovery, and that sets the stage for businesses to emerge stronger than ever on the other side. Profits eventually return and exceed their pre-crisis highs, and that leads to an inflation in stock prices. And there's a theme that I keep bringing up, in part because I feel like so many individual investors either don't think about it or don't understand how it works, but that's why I keep emphasizing the change in valuations. These these things that you're describing can create optimism for investors who are suddenly willing to pay more for a company's stock or for a full country's market of stocks because they know these things are going to help earnings grow over time. I think also, though, you pretty nicely outline some of the reasons that earnings, just broadly speaking, go up over time. Um, Maybe you could walk through some of those and and give some simple examples. Mm -hmm. Broadly speaking, there are a few forces in play in the economy in general that tend to lead businesses to have higher profits uh, over long periods of time. I'll tick through a couple of them here. Uh, First and foremost is inflation. I mean, what is inflation? Inflation is businesses raising prices on each other. And that could be because their costs are going up, their labor costs are going up, et cetera. While inflation right now is very high, seven or eight to eight percent, depending on the month. If you look back at the last, say, 40 years, the inflation rate averages about two to three percent ish or or so. So inflation by and large increases a company's revenue and therefore increases a company's profits in absolute terms. Now, that's an absolute increase. Investors shouldn't value that too much, um, but that is something that causes uh, corporate profits to, to grow. Secondly, is productivity. Productivity is a fancy word for humans get better and better each and every year at producing more and more goods and services for the same or less inputs. So humans are, thanks to uh, mechanization, thanks to to innovation, humans get better and better at producing goods at more more efficiently over time. That leads to, uh, broadly speaking, lower uh, prices and opening up new markets of consumers, and those consumers can come in and uh, create new revenue opportunities uh, for business. That, by and large, leads to higher revenue and higher profits uh, at companies over time. Third is is innovation. Uh, New products and new services come to market, which open up brand new market opportunities. I mean, what was the market value of search engines in 1995? Zero? (laughs) Zero? Uh, maybe a million dollars, right? <laughs> How much did Google make off of search engines last year? Tens of billions uh, of dollars. You could say the same thing for many businesses that the internet ha- ha- has opened up. So while when uh, new innovations come out, some old markets are destroyed, uh, by and large, the net result of those innovations coming and is they open up new markets and revenue and profits of companies, uh, the economy, actually grow uh, and expand over time. Another factor is just population uh, growth. The the population of the world continues to increase each and every year, not by much, by 1%, maybe uh, maybe 2%. But that means there's 1% to 2% more consumers uh, out there that need need to buy products uh, and and services. And then the final one is just geographic uh, expansion, right? Uh, If you look at the biggest companies in the world today, Apple, uh, Microsoft, uh, Nike, McDonald's, while they are headquartered, quartered in the United States, a lot of their growth and a lot of their revenue today actually comes from outside uh, of the United States. So as companies in the U.S. grow and mature, in order to gr- continue to grow their profits, they look to international uh, markets to open up new opportunities for themselves. So when you take all of those factors together, by and large, maybe they increase profits by 1% to 3% in any given year, but they stack on top of each other. They work together. And this is why over long periods of time, uh, the profits of the companies in the major indices continually tick higher. And you know, they, it's those little things compounded over decades that makes investing what you call something like the greatest wealth creation machine, um, something like that in the book. And it seems, you know, we've 
you've laid it out so simply and it seems so easy. Everyone should be able to invest and trust and understand these reasons why earnings grow over time and trust that prices over the long term are going to track with earnings. But yet people put money in all sorts of mutual funds that end up underperforming. So why is it that so many people, and well, let's just focus on mutual funds, struggle to outperform or even perform alongside the market? Yeah, by by and large, uh, any way that you can get money into the market is better than not putting money in into the market. Uh, if you look back historically, uh, mutual funds were an attractive alternative for a lot of people. Right? We could pool our money together. We could hire a professional manager. That money manager would go out and deploy our capital in an effort to earn a return, and that return would, in theory, uh, beat beat the, beat the returns of the index of the uh, the market um, in general. That is a wonderful uh, theory, but if you know any thing about investing, mutual funds are actually structurally at a disadvantage uh, to, to beat the market, which is why the studies show that the vast majority of mutual funds actually fail to outperform the market over long periods of time. That's not because mutual fund managers are dumb or they don't know what they're, they're doing or anything like that. It's just the actual structural nature of mutual funds make it hard for them uh, to outperform. Uh, first off, mutual funds tend to be much higher cost than, than index funds. Um, I don't know the exact number, but I believe the last time I looked, the average mutual fund had an expense ratio of like 0.7 or 0.8%. You compare that to an index fund, which has an expense ratio of like 0.1%. Uh, and that right there, just from a starting point, is a half a percent or up to a full percent drag on returns when compared to an index fund. Another one is that uh, a mutual fund manager has career risk to keep, to keep in mind. Mutual funds, by and large, make more money, not by outperforming the market, but they make more money by gathering assets and gathering and retaining assets in particular. Uh, a mutual fund that manages $10 million will make far less money than one that manages a billion dollars, regardless of the performance of the fund. That incentivizes man uh, mutual fund managers to constantly be in asset gathering mode, not necessarily an investment optimization uh, mode. And that dichotomy causes many mutual funds to essentially become closet uh, index funds and to, to hug the index uh, because they know that if their performance diverges from the index in the downward direction over a short period of time, people are going to pull their money out. Even if the mutual fund manager knows that their or believes that their strategy is going to outperform over the long term, investor psychology is to judge what's happening right now and judge, ju judge their manager over really short uh, uh, time periods. Uh, given that, it makes total sense why mutual funds uh, optimize themselves for longevity and asset gathering, not necessarily um, for, for outperformance. Um, so managing, managing your own money, like, like I do, is hard. Managing somebody else's money is like an order of magnitude, a more magnitude harder. Uh, that's why so many people, myself included, say just avoid mutual funds uh, altogether and just put your money into broad-based index funds. You're guaranteed to do just as well as the market does over a long period of time and remove that underperformance risk. Yeah, and I'll add my own little commentary to that because what I think of as a traditionally active mutual fund where security selection and timing is very important to performance. You mentioned how they're structurally not set up to succeed because, and, and just to add to that, even when they do outperform and assets start flowing in, that actually makes it harder to continue to outperform because uh, the bets that you had to make to outperform are harder to do with, with more dollars. I don't want to go too deep down that hole because we could spend a whole hour talking about that. I appreciated you touching on your book. And I also appreciated you went through a series of mistakes and I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to go for one and, and make everybody else check out the book. But I think it's timely for right now where people sometimes feel like they should stop investing if the economy is bad or if they're feeling nervous about the direction of the economy. W what would you say to that? That is very, very enticing to do, right? It's very, it's it's so enticing to want to look at what's happening uh, in the market, look what's happening in the economy, and then draw conclusions about what's going to happen in the stock market uh, uh, next and say, okay, I can't invest right now. It's too dicey out there. I can't invest right now. There's too much un uncertainty uh, out there. Well, uh, in the book, I borrowed a, um, a chapter or a graphic from my friend Ben Carlson, who's written many uh, great books, and he had this killer 
particular stat that I just find uh, fascinating. What is the return, the average annualized return of the S&P 500 when the unemployment rate is over 9%, over 9%? The answer is almost 25% per year. Let me say that again. When the unemployment rate is over 9%, the average annual return, annualized return of the S&P 500 moving forward is 25%. That blows away the return of um, the average return, which is about uh, 9 to 10%. Year. Conversely, what is the annualized return of the S&P 500 when the unemployment rate is under 5%? That's a good thing. Unemployment rate is under 5%. The answer there is uh, the return, annualized return of the S&P 500 is about 4% per year. So the worse the economy is doing, the worse the unemployment rate is, the higher the returns of the S&P 500. Conversely, the better the economy is doing, the lower the unemployment rate, the lower the returns. How on earth can that, can that be? Uh, that's because the, S, the um, unemployment rate is a lagging indicator. It shows what just happened. But the market is a future indicator. The market is always looking forward. And when is the market most likely to be depressed and, and therefore be a really good time to buy? After the economy has gone through a really, really rough uh, period. So the worse the market has done recently, that actually indicates that future returns are going to be, be higher. So the worst thing you can do when the market is going down or the economy is looking grim is to stop investing because history shows that's actually the best time to put your capital in. And allow me to offer some context in, in terms of what we're seeing today. And certainly clients ask me these questions where there's no all clear signal to say that investing your money is quote safe or we're just going to have positive returns. By the time everything's all clear, the big rally has happened. You know, the big rallies tend to happen on less bad news, not definitively good news. And I think that aligns with what you're saying. And also, as we look at the context today, we're in a very low employment environment and the stock market is down because it's saying, well, the Fed has to raise rates to choke off inflation, and maybe that'll lead to lower profits in the future. You kind of are able to build a better narrative when you understand how both at the micro and macro level, these things in the stock market really work. Um, so again, Brian, bravo to you on this book. I think it's absolutely wonderful. I I'm pretty sure it's going to be a, a staple in those that I give out to people from now on. But I'd be curious, prior to you writing this book, and you talk a little in the introduction why you wrote it, but what are some books that you typically have recommended in the past to those who are just looking to learn a little bit more about investing and finance and et cetera? Yeah, I, I, I've read all of the classic books about uh, investing. When I first discovered the idea of personal finance, money, and the stock market, I devoured absolutely everything uh, that I could get my, my hands on. Back in the mid-2000s when I was doing that, that was, of course, all of the Peter uh, Lynch books. One up, on, uh, one up on Wall Street was a classic favorite. Uh, the Motley Fool has a fantastic book called The Motley Fool Investment Guide. I devoured everything by Robert Kiyosaki, which was not necessarily about the stock market, but was about investing in, in general. Um, I, I've read books um, uh, about Warren Buffett, by, by Charlie Munger, by Seth, by Seth Klarman. All of those are fantastic authors to say nothing of the great books that Jack uh, Jack Bogle has written about the virtues of, of index uh, investing. Uh, more recently, a couple of, of my recent favorites, uh, Nick Majuli's book, um, um, Just Keep Buying, is absolutely fantastic. Morgan Housel's book, The Psychology of, of Money. Uh, J.L. Collins' uh, book, The Simple Path to Wealth. Are, I think those three books are just uh, classics that have been written in the last five uh, years. But investors today are spoiled. There are so many wonderful books out there about how to invest, how the stock market works. Um, but those are a few that come to mind as being excellent. I could not agree more on those more recent classics that you listed there. Um, one final question to wrap things up, Brian. What does it mean to you to be a long-term investor? Well, to me, long-term investing is everything. And I, I didn't discover long-term investing uh, because I wanted to. I discovered it because short-term investing just doesn't work. Uh, I know of no way uh, to consistently make money uh, of investing in the short term because in make money in the short term, you have to be right about the future direction of human emotions. And I don't know what kind of mood I'm going to be in later today. How on earth could I know what kind of mood investors are going to be in one month from now, three months from now, six 
six months uh, from now. That's not, that's saying you can not only predict what the news is going to be during that time period, which is hard enough, but you have to invest. You have to know what investors are going to, how investors collectively are going to interpret the news and how that is going to uh, affect uh, their mood. Uh, that's why I think the only way to invest successfully is to invest with a long-term uh, mindset. Literally develop a multi-year and a multi-decade uh, even better uh, time horizon. That stat that you said before um, about how often the S&P 500 delivers a positive real return uh, speaks volumes uh, to me. Essentially, over a short term, which you could argue is less than a three-year period, anything can happen. Absolutely anything could happen. The market could go, the market could double or the market could fall uh, 60% uh, during that period. I have no way of predicting that. However, the data clearly shows over long periods of time, over multiple decades, the stock market, the U.S. stock market has been a fantastic wealth creation machine that delivers relatively stable and relatively um, reliable returns when measured over long periods uh, of time. If you have an interest in money and in building wealth, uh, as everybody listening to this uh, should, as long as you continually put money into the stock market, buy during good times, buy during bad times, and hold for the long term, the odds of you having a smile on your face 10, 20, and 30 years from now are unbelievably high. Imagine if a newspaper only came out once a decade, how much that might help people. Um, well, Brian, I appreciate those thoughts. Why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? I'll be sure to link it in the show notes. The, I'm, I'm active on all the social platforms. I'm most active on Twitter. Uh, that's my name, at Brian Feraldi. Uh, if, you're individual, if you're interested in individual stock analysis, I also have a YouTube channel, Brian Feraldi, where we dig more into the weeds of SEC filings and things like that. Again, Brian, I know you intended this book for beginners, but really, I think all listeners would enjoy this. Um, again, go to the show notes at thelongterminvestor.com. I will link to Why Does the Stock Market Go Up? Brian, thanks so much again for joining us and to everybody else. Until next time, to long-term investing.